The following KQED production was produced in high definition. You've heard of better living through chemistry, but how about better living through nanotechnology? The dry inside, here we have 100% natural cotton, and we've actually changed it at the molecular level. So when I put water on the inside of dry inside, and it soaks in, what you'll see is the moisture moves to the outside of the fabric, but the inside of the fabric stays dry. So it now makes for a much better uh, user experience when you're wearing cotton, which people love, in an activewear situation. Nanotechnology, the science of manipulating extremely small particles and materials, has great potential to revolutionize everything from medicine to solar energy. And already, nanomaterials are cropping up in hundreds of consumer products, from sunscreens to golf clubs. What nanotechnology lets us do is it lets us make changes to those fabrics in a way which is really discreet, uh, so that you can't tell that the fabric has been changed. Silk feels like silk, wool feels like wool. We do change the actual uh, molecular structure of that fabric. We don't work with things like nanoparticles, uh, which have been in the news lately, that have some uh, concerns around them. These newsworthy man-made nanoparticles, thousands of times smaller than the width of a human hair, are at the heart of the nanomaterials controversy. As elements get this small, their behaviors change in strange and often unpredictable ways, giving them properties they wouldn't have at the macro scale. Carbon nanotubes, for example, are billionths of a meter in diameter and hundreds of times stronger than steel. But these novel behaviors are raising concerns among some critics who worry about their impact on the environment and human health and the lack of federal standards to regulate them. Right now there's a major gold rush that's going on with nanotechnology. Uh, but no one's thinking about what happens at the end of life of those products and what the health and environmental impacts are. With reputations and revenues on the line, safety to the consumer is a big concern for firms like Nanotex. Because there isn't a lot of regulation in the industry today, it creates some concerns among people. Are all these, are all these products vetted? Uh, you know, have they been proven to be safe? So we go through extensive testing of all of our technologies before they come out on the market. They're evaluated for skin sensitivity, for dermal irritation, for toxicity. What's the impact of our product going in the effluent, in the water stream? If we are not putting a safe product on the marketplace, we, we don't have a business. But what about safety for workers fabricating nanomaterials? Dr. John Howard is the director of NIOSH, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health in DC. Well, one of the questions people always have is, well, how could uh, a filter on my respirator that I've been using for years, how could it work for a particle so small? Because when you look at a respirator filter, it's actually like a lattice work. If you have a particle that gets very, very small, then as Einstein showed us when he discovered Brownian motion, it's going to be bouncing all over the place. So the probability is even greater that it's going to hit one of those lattice works and never get through. Whereas, if you have a particle that's much bigger, let's say 300 nanometers, it's not going to move around as much, so the likelihood it, it will have a straighter trajectory and will actually go through one of those holes. The idea that larger particles might pass through a filter more easily than smaller particles hints at the counterintuitive nature of nanomaterials. In fact, researchers believe the unique physical characteristics caused by their tininess are directly tied to the toxic potential of nanomaterials. The toxicity issues basically boil down to what I call the three S's, size, shape, and surface area. 
So of all the three S's for toxicity that we're all looking at, surface area seems to be the property that may relate more to toxicity. To understand more about the toxicity of nanomaterials, researchers at the University of California at Davis are performing tests using common nanoparticles. Here, they're investigating carbon nanotubes. Our interest has been in an occupational setting whether carbon nanotubes could be inhaled and enter into the respiratory tract into the deep, deepest portions of the lung due to their small size. Getting carbon nanotubes, which cost $1,000 a gram, into a form that can be inhaled by lab rats required some ingenuity. This system is designed in such a way that we can actually pack this needle or syringe with carbon nanotubes, which then are slowly advanced into the path of a rotating diamond knife. We actually create a, a fragmentation of the carbon nanotubes to a size that allows them to be respirable by the rodents. The rats inhaled the nanotubes for up to six hours at a time. Although their lung cells did experience inflammation, they recovered over time. So far, man-made nanoparticles have not been shown to harm humans, but the UC Davis study and others like it are reminding us just how much we still don't know about nanoparticle toxicity. Meanwhile, commercial interest in the nano world is accelerating, and the lack of federal regulation of products made with nanotechnology has some environmental groups concerned and wanting answers. The most important information, of course, is the last page right. on the exposures and the risk assessment. And um, the San Jose based nonprofit Silicon Valley Toxics Coalition sent out a survey to the more than 100 companies and institutions in the Bay Area working in nanotech. Uh, we created a survey in order to get information from the companies. Right now, there's really no requirement for the companies to report to any of the regulatory agencies. If a company wants to do the right thing, if they want to conduct a toxicological study, um, if they want to find out or figure out whether or not there's any health or environmental hazards associated with their products, um, it, they almost put themselves at an economic and a competitive disadvantage um, because the other companies aren't doing the same. Presently, there are more than 600 products using nanotechnology on the market. The question is, can federal agencies regulate these with existing environmental laws, many of which are more than 30 years old and don't acknowledge the existence of nanoparticles? Well, people always ask, well, you know, why aren't there regulations and, and uh, why isn't the government regulating nanotechnology? Uh, when government decides to regulate something is they have to know what harm they're preventing. They could be challenged in court. So someone could say, well, where's your evidence? The likelihood is, unless you have that evidence of harm, um, you're probably going to fail in defending your regulation. As the debate rages on, the worldwide market for nano-manufactured goods is expected to exceed $2 trillion by 2014. I think the onus is on both businesses and consumers to understand this new emerging field. Um, consumers need to understand what this might mean for them, uh, not only what the potentials are, but uh, what should they uh, look for, what should they question. As scientists push the limits of nanotechnology forward, a new world of potential solutions lies in front of us. Think clean water for everyone, or super-efficient solar panels. But with so many unknowns, it's a future that could evaporate in a single moment. Nanotechnology's future, both in the United States and internationally, I think is going to depend on how much investment we make in risk assessment and risk management now in the first decade of the 21st century. And God forbid something should happen in the nanotechnology world where we have a health effect and we don't have those answers, then we will lose the public's confidence and we will have uh, a, a stillborn technology that does not come to the promise that we all know it can. You can make Quest even better. Take a short online survey for a chance to win a $50 gift certificate to Amazon at kqed.org quest.